morning, as was already mentioned. And as we mentioned as we started out this morning, uh, our theme. And we've been, uh, since the beginning of January, uh, we started out the first four uh, months of the year uh, in, with uh, centered around the uh, subject of hope. And then uh, right now we're currently through the end of uh, August uh, centering around the subject of love. And we're going to be, uh, beginning in September, uh, moving into the subject of good works. I'd like to read for you, uh, just as we can have this fresh on our minds, our theme, from Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In uh, verses 23 and 24 is where we have centered our theme for the year uh, along the uh, confession of hope and the stirring up of one another to love and good works. Kyle brought a lesson, a very excellent lesson last week about provoking on the, on the uh, definition of that stir up and the provoking. So I want to take a look a little bit. I had planned a lesson uh, weeks before uh, to present this morning, but Kyle kind of stole it from me last week. So I've gone to another one that's it's, uh, a, a lot like it. It's going to be hopefully very complimentary. And it'll bring back some of the points uh, that, uh, that Kyle presented us uh, last week. I want to thank Bill for, for the prayer this morning, especially about the, the remembrance. Uh, as each day goes by, it gets harder and harder for the remembrance and for the recall. So I appreciate the prayer uh, on my behalf. You know, uh, one of the blessings, many, but one of the blessings that we have being a child of God is to lean on our brothers, our brethren. And when we do that is generally in a time when there's a time of grave need or crisis. And it could be spiritual, it could be physical. We know from verses, some that we've already looked at, that Corey read for us, that those who are stronger help to hold up those who are not. It's part of Christ's law to bear one another's burdens. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans, the 15th chapter. We're going to specifically look at verse 1, but we could read down through verse 6, and it would still be appropriate. In fact, let's do read down through verse 6. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproaches, reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse 1 it says, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Turning back over to Galatians 6 that Corey read for us, in verse 1, if a brethren is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. 
And then again in verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We can see from right here the law of Christ, it, bearing one another's burdens is part of that law. So those who are strong have a responsibility to those who are not so strong. But at the same time, we also have a responsibility to become strong or stronger. Again in Galatians 6, verses 4 and 5, but let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. We have this responsibility. Turning back to the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 12. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. That's a scary thought. We have the responsibility that we are to bear our own load. But yet, we need to bear, help bear the burdens of those who are not quite so strong. And we're going to give account for everything that we've done. I personally, when I think of it, you ever see a kid go like that? Gives me the shivers when I think of that. To stand before the majesty of our creator and explain everything that I have done. Turn over, if you would, to Hebrews, the 12th chapter. All of this is going to make sense here in a minute. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Have you ever found yourself in a situation? And it could be a relationship. It could be with uh, a thing. Um, it could be with a flower garden and a rock wall that requires a lot of attention. Is everybody familiar with the phrase that everybody uses? When you, a lot of times, it's, it's in a relationship. That person is high maintenance. I want to look this morning. Wrong key. There we go. Back again. Am I high maintenance? And for uh, uh, definition, again, High maintenance is somebody or something that requires a lot of attention, a lot of time, and a lot of effort. We're going to look at both sides. But I'd like for us to be asking our, our, ourselves throughout this lesson, am I high maintenance? There are some Christians for, some, for whatever reason, never seem to progress from being supported to supporting themselves. They remain very dependent upon their brethren. Unless constantly nurtured by brethren, they fall away or become apathetic. Such brethren are what might be described as high maintenance. This morning we're going to consider the, the following, am I high maintenance? When is it okay to be high maintenance? And what is meant by high maintenance, which hopefully we've just uh, gone over. And we'll go through this more as we go along. So let's go into a little bit more definition of high maintenance. As we use it in everyday speech, it's required to maintain something in good order, and it requires a lot of time, energy, and sometimes money. So any person or thing that requires a lot of attention, a lot of people here restore cars, or people I work with restore cars. I know uh, restoring motorcycles. You go out and you find one, 
you look for the parts, you want to put it back into the uh, same condition it was when, uh, when it was in its prime, uh, whatever year it may be. You, you go spend a lot of time and effort in researching for parts uh, that are genuine and that will fit. I know some people in here uh, happen to be in supervisory roles. Has anybody encountered an employee? Or has anybody had a coworker that is considered high maintenance? Someone who requires a lot of time and effort for them to do their job. Or how about a relationship, significant others? You hear all the time about girlfriends or fiancés or whatever they may be. down one, <laughs> uh, that require a lot of gifts, or they have to be taken someplace all the time. Otherwise, they'll lose interest. So in our definition here this morning, Christians, we as Christians, can sometimes be considered high maintenance if we require a lot of attention to remain faithful, if we require a lot of coddling or pampering to be active. You can say that Christians that are high maintenance are, are in one of two categories. They're either really new, babes in Christ, just starting their new spiritual life, or they are Christians who have become slothful. Slothful in attendance and work only when constantly prodded. Even churches can be considered high maintenance or not. Turn over to 1 Corinthians. Something we've just gone through here recently. In 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, the first four verses. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? When one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not carnal? Now if you would turn over to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, in verses 20 and 21. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. Sometimes even churches can be considered high maintenance. But keep in mind the people that make up that church are the individual members, the individual Christians, that we each have the responsibility to grow from a babe to an adult. If you would, turn over to Philippians. We'll look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, verses 3 through 7. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think of this, of this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are, you all are partakers with me of grace. It's a contrast of two churches, the church in Corinth and the church in Philippi. One wasn't progressing the way it should actually was regressing. One progressed far beyond the, uh, the hopes of Paul, and he told him so. 
So even churches. So what's the point of all this? Some high maintenance is good and necessary in the work of the local church. But when it exists where it shouldn't, then there can be some problems. So that's what I want to focus on this morning, the good and the bad of high maintenance. Again, asking myself all along, am I high maintenance? Where high maintenance can help, and this is going to be very familiar to all of us that are parents and those that are soon to be. Everybody knows how much attention and care a newborn baby requires. But do we do it because we have to? What is there that exists that allows for that high maintenance of newborn children? Could it possibly have anything to do with love? We love newborn babies. I know someone is if there's a newborn baby, it's like a magnet for them. They got to be with the baby, got to have the baby. And that's good. These are times when high maintenance is good and necessary. Without it, the child won't grow. The child won't get what it needs to grow. Uh, just as it is for the physical baby, those who are babes in Christ, when they first start out, even though it may not seem like this, because their faith has driven them to the decision that they made, but they are still weak in faith, they are weak in knowledge, and they are very susceptible to things that are around them. And without the proper attention, they can be very soon overcome. We must give that proper attention where it's needed. We must give the high maintenance where it's needed and where it will do the most good. High maintenance is essential for a hurting Christian. Someone that's hurting, we all know someone who's hurting, has hurt. When they're sick, when they're injured, physically, we understand that. But when they're overtaken in a fault, as Galatians 6 1, they're suffering physical illness or, per or persecution, they can become weak. And when I say weak, I mean not as strong. Without the proper attention, they too may soon be overwhelmed. In such cases, high maintenance is certainly called for. I'd like to, uh, to look at a passage in 1 Thessalonians, if you'd turn over there, if you will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. There are things that we must do. And part of that is outlined here in verse 14, falls under high maintenance. But where can high maintenance hurt? The first one I can think of is when it hinders the growth of the church. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, what do you mean? How can being, someone being high maintenance hinder the growth of the church? Well, the church grows through three ways. We spent a lot of time studying about this not too long ago. Evangelism, edification, and benevolence. But none of those can be given the proper attention that they're due if we're too busy spending our time someplace else. And with that, it holds back the efforts of Christians as workers. Turn over to Romans 15. We'll go back there one more time. 
Let's take a look at an example that Paul was referring to. This is an effort or a desire of Paul's. Paul desired to preach everywhere that Christ was not named. And he says so in verse 20 of, chapter, of Romans chapter 15. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Now turn back over to 2 Corinthians. So we see that the aim of Paul was to preach. He wanted to go and spend his time and his efforts in areas where Christ was not named. People that needed to hear the gospel of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Okay, that wasn't exactly the, the scripture that I was looking for, so we'll, uh, we'll chalk that one up to uh, an oops. But anyway, uh, but as we had read earlier that the churches in Corinth had held Paul back. Paul spent a lot of his time, he, he wrote two letters, well, actually three, that, uh, that we know of because he mentions another letter uh, in his letters to the, to the Corinthians, or in his first letter to the Corinthians. So he spent a lot of time and effort with the brethren in Corinth. You know, were they worth it? Obviously so. Obviously so. Paul had a lot of love for them. They were high maintenance to Paul. But yet we also see from uh, what he wrote to the Romans that his desire was to go everywhere where Christ was not named. So his desire was to go this way when he was being held back here. Another way that, that, uh, that high maintenance can hurt, when more serious needs go unmet. For example, a babe in Christ not being helped because too many others expect coddling. The sick and dying being neglected because others require attention. What I mean by this is this. I'm sure all of us have heard at some point uh, in our spiritual lives, when you run across brethren who uh, just don't seem to have the drive that you do. And oftentimes it takes just a little light breeze and they're off in a different direction. And so when you, uh, time goes by and you, and, you, uh, and you try to get a hold of them, you call them and say, hey, where have you been? How can I help you? Well, nobody really cares about me because nobody until you has ever called me. Nobody, ever care nobody cares for me. Nobody's ever called me. In other words, we expect people to come to us. Kyle mentioned this in his letter, or letter, lesson last week. And... Uh, it's one that I was talking with another brother about just, just recently, that we really, really, really like this illustration. Do you remember the illustration of, are you wearing a bib or are you wearing an apron? Let me ask you, all too often times, doesn't it seem to you that most people kind of default to wearing a bib? So here's my question to you. If we're all wearing bibs, who's wearing the apron? Bibs are necessary, but so are aprons. There are times in our spiritual lives when we all require some high maintenance. But to avoid keeping it from those who really need it, we should give the following some serious thought and effort. We need to, we can defeat the need for high maintenance through our individual growth. 
We need high maintenance when we're babes in Christ, but we should reach a point where we do not need it. We need to reach a point, here again, the bib and the apron. The bib is the recipient. The apron is the provider. We need to become providers and not just recipients. You probably knew I was going to get to this eventually. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, hopefully you knew that I was going to get to this eventually. Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Brethren, we need to get to that point. We need to dedicate ourselves to growing. We talked a lot, a little bit at the beginning about uh, bearing our own load, or bearing the, the, the burdens of our brethren, bearing our own loads, and then standing before God one day to justify, give an answer and to justify, well, it'll be justification to us. It, 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 it'll sound like justification to God, but to God it'll be me, 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 me. So anyway, kind of like Charlie Brown's mom or Charlie Brown's teacher, uh, but we must give the effort to increase ourselves. Again, I ask you, if all of us are wearing bibs, who's left to wear an apron? And then we, we end up in the same way that the Christians he was writing to in the, in the, uh, in the book of Hebrews on the condition that they were in. Wouldn't it be sad if you have to stand before God one day when you give an answer for yourself and he said, all you've had is milk. You've never had meat. How healthy would we be physically if that was the case, by the way? The parents give and the mothers give the, the, uh, the nurture and the attention to a newborn babe. For what purpose? Yes, I know it's, it's out of love. But for what purpose? That purpose is to grow, to bring them along. A newborn babe doesn't start out on solid food. A newborn babe so starts out with soft food. We all understand that. It's like, okay, Rob, enough of that point. Move on with it. But it's important. If you stay in that stage and you never make it to the other stage, to the solid food stage, you are not going to be very healthy. But through individual growth also comes individual strength. Strength from brethren is certainly helpful when we need it. But again, we should also reach a point where our strength comes from God. When we become producers and not consumers, we need to be providers, not recipients, and we need to be producers and not consumers. I'd like for you to, for a few seconds to consider the example of the Apostle Paul along these lines. Turn over, if you would, to the book of Philippians. Look at chapter 4, and specifically verses 11 through 13. Well, let's start with verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Notice what he said here? Your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, 
and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Turn over or turn back, if you would, to the uh, book of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, again we'll read verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Where was Paul's focus? Where was Paul's thought? Would you say that Paul was someone who was in need of high maintenance? That he was in need of someone, uh, someone who was in need of constant attention? And constant, oh, Paul, you're so good, you're so great. Oh, man, I haven't met a better speaker than you. Oh, you're so good. Was Paul that kind of guy? My purpose this morning has not been to discourage high maintenance when it is rightly needed. We learn from Galatians 6, 2 that we are to bear one another's burden. We learn from Romans 15 in verse 1 that we are to bear, that the strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak. So my desire has not been to, to discourage, but to challenge. I'd like to challenge each and every one of us here this morning in constantly thinking about our service to Christ, to reflect about our work in the kingdom, Galatians 6, 4. And are we bearing our own load, Galatians 6, 5. When a bur uh, burden becomes unbearable, that's the point when we need high maintenance from our brethren. When failure to bear our own load requires high maintenance, that is when we hinder the cause of Christ. Some things to think about this morning. And as we began, so will we end. Am I high maintenance? Is it time for me to take off the bib? and put on the apron? Please consider that. In Proverbs 18 and verse 9, it reads, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Are you high maintenance? Am I high maintenance? Either way, a change needs to be made, if we are. That change can be made today, if you're willing. To let it be known, to ask for the prayers and the encouragement and the nurturing and the coddling of your brethren. Coddling is good. Coddling is good when it's needed. And we all need that at some point in time. Oftentimes more than once. If that's the case, please make that known this morning. If you have never taken that step to name Christ as your Savior, that can be taken care of this morning as well and is needed. And again, you can make that known this morning. Whatever your case or your situation may be, if it applies and you are in need, now is the best time. You know, there's a song that we sing. It was in one of our old songbooks. Today 
is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. If you're subject, please come while we stand and sing.